Before I get started, I want to say that the SEO Rockstar thing was self-deprecating humor because 25 years ago in my goal in life, I moved to LA and played in big hair bands on the Hollywood Sunset Strip. And uh, I met and married my groupie. And then I became an internet geek because that didn't really pan out because uh, this Kurt Cobain guy in the city of Seattle, I was a keyboard player. And when he showed up, all of a sudden there was no work for heavy metal, hard rock keyboard players. So I had to retire and find a new thing, and I found the internet, so when we started the SEO Rockstar thing, it was all about making fun of myself because it's so not being a rock star. But waiting there to come online and come up here, it felt like being backstage at the Roxy. <laughs> like, it's time to go on stage and hit it. So um, but I want to thank Rand for letting me come here and do this. And you know, when I talked to Rand in a SMX and I asked him about, um, he asked me if I'd come do this. And I looked at all the speakers that were here, and I was just like, man, there's so many great tactical stuff that's going to be going on here. Um, so how about if I go and talk about what I've been spending the last two years on and come and basically spill my guts about all the mistakes that we've made since our company came into existence two years ago and talk about how to actually implement models to support all this. Like, how do you go off and, and do all that kind of stuff? Um, so I will start with the official About Blue Glass page that my marketing team does. Um, and that's our thing. We're a full service digital agency. That's what we aspire to be. Um, but me personally, I spent 14 years as a solo independent consultant uh, in the boutique kind of space. Um, great lifestyle, loved it helped me be around to coach my kids, sports teams, all that kind of stuff. So I was a hired gun that would go around and develop organic strategy, primarily SEO. So I actually did start doing SEO before it had a name, hanging out on iSearch and these little email lists because there was no blogs or forums or any of that. A guy like Marshall Simmons who's in here, he's as old as me. And um, so I did that for 14 years and got to the point where really in this business, what is difficult to me is that there's this huge body of really talented boutique sized shops that do really quality work. And then up here, way up here, there's big bloated mediocre agencies that suck. And there's a big gap there and you hit that wall and it's like, so what, what, how do you get past that? How do you get, and we would sit there and feed off the crumbs from these agencies. I'm not going to say because they did terrible work. People would circle back, hire guys like us and we all did a great job. And there's a lot of those sites, and I'm very passionate about that space. Um, so what ended up happening was a bunch of guys got together um, and decided to mash up, this is June of 2010, mash up a, a bunch of boutiques and become like a really kick-ass agency that does really good work, like kind of overnight thing. And so I, they talked me, I was at Oktoberfest in Munich in September, and they talked me into come merging with them and coming on board after they mashed up in June to run the search division. I'm like, oh, that's great. I can build this new big thing. That's cool. Um, so I went from there. There we go. Uh, well, we, let me go back because I missed a slide. So I started out running the search division. I came in there. I was doing that. That was cool, whatever, SEO. That's my thing. Um, then we ran into issues, and I ended up moving on to the president of products and services because all these problems I'm going to talk about happened, and we had to actually fix them, and I somehow volunteered, and my partner said, okay, cool, I'm going to go and try to retool this and fix all the mistakes and things we didn't think about so we can actually become what we want to be. Um, so then from that point, I dropped the products and services in January, um, and the first this is actually true because signing up for PubCon, speaker registration form, and you got to know Brett Tabke to really appreciate this. but. Um, I got my badge and it said President of Pump, and it was cut off because he had a character limit, and it was ridiculous. Um, but the other thing too is, I, I, moving to just the president, I get to be in a role with a VP and work with a guy named uh, Lauren Baker, who really is that much bigger than me, if, for those of you guys that know him. Uh, we call him the VP of Excitement, he's our business dev guy, but I really wanted to work with Lauren because he gets the client relationship and and all the stuff that goes into building this and just is great at that stuff. So I'm like, all right, let's you and I go and start 
preaching this new message. Let's go out and start changing the conversation um, with these big brands. So now, now to the panda and penguin thing. So real quick, I'm going to recap, and it's a little sarcastic probably, my interpretation of you know, why we're spending so much time talking about zoo animals. Um, here's kind of what happened. Be prior to June of two, they talked about caffeine. They put up a beta thing. They ran through it. Great, great, great. It's all cool. We're going to expand and do all this awesome stuff, this new infrastructure. It's really cool. Um, so they released it in June. Size of their index explodes. 100x, because now they're spidering stuff in real time and all that kind of stuff. Never in that time period, I don't think, did they think about that, hey, maybe more spam is going to get into the index when we do this. Um, they had a lot of cool automated filtering stuff, keyword that would actually make you not rank for bad anchor text and then allow you to come back when you fixed it without having to grovel and file a reconsideration. Um, but it wasn't keeping up. And a ton of everybody have, have started writing articles in the major press saying how bad Google sucks and their quality's gone downhill. And then uh, on top of that, in October of 2010, they threw out this ridiculous localization where they took all the places stuff and made 17 listings on it, put that big block of crap that nobody clicked on. So it was just a chaotic mess, and the results were not good. And then by February, we've moved to, or retreating to, iterative filtering, which is a nice way to say hand jobs, um, in the sense that now we have all this cool infrastructure. We can do all this stuff in real time, but the results aren't that great. So every six weeks, we got to go run a filter to clean it up. Seems counterproductive and stepping backwards to me, but that's where they're at because their automated tools can't keep up with what they can crawl and index. And then from there, a year later, we have a little behavioral correction. And make no mistake, Panda is not about getting rid of links that were helping you, it's about changing your behavior. And that is really, and I, I I'll tell you why, because from that standpoint, now we have everyone's skeletons are out of the closet. And I don't care who you are in SEO, everybody's got a skeleton. So now you're having to go out and try to clean up links that you did through e-zine articles or awesome directory article submission.com, whatever, from 2007, and you've got to go clean 65, 70% of that up before Google's going to allow you to get back in. But once you get back in, you rank right where you did before. So it's not like the links are really counting, I don't think. I think they had that figured out. It's more about them sending a message to all of us that we really want you to change your behavior. So that creates a situation where we've got all this chaos. It's getting more and more difficult, and it's, getting, and it's, it's harder to do. So growing your company and, and maintaining quality and not becoming that big, bloated, mediocre agency that sucks is very difficult. So that's our goal. This is what we're trying to do during all this, this chaos that's going on. And in the course of that, we did so much stuff wrong. Or we overlooked. So we just really thought you could bang up five companies. And because we were all good at what we did individually, that would be extra more awesome if we were all mashed together. So I'm going to walk through a lot of the issues that we ran and, and give you some idea of the stuff that we did to overcome them, because I can say right now that we have fixed most of them. We're always working to be better, but um, we're going to survive, right? We're a real company now. So that's a good thing. Um, issue number one, siloed internet structures. You really can't build integrated services if you're working in silos. And then John's talk was about that, and him and I have talked about that personally, and, but I can't stress this one enough. Um, when I came into Blue, and this is a true story, came in, I'm running search, I'm on a call with a client, and I look at this thing they did, and I'm like, who the hell told you to do that? That's literally the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Oh, your social media division said to do that. Really? That's when I raised my hand and said, could I have the job of trying to retool this? Like, that's just unacceptable. But when we all came together, you know, the analogy I always use, we were like the food court at the mall. We were all under one roof, but because we tried to just start business right away and not really have any downtime, we were locked into these little silos and each partner was running one silo and talking to clients and doing that kind of stuff. Um, so what we did, 
is uh, we tore down the silos completely. Um, we ditched channel specific silos if it is structured based on client lifecycle. So what I mean by that is, especially when you're a small shop, you do all the things. There's really three key phases in this position. There's strategy development, which is ideation, research, auditing, collecting your data, building the client dossiers, all the stuff you've got to do to build a plan. And then the second phase of that is production. You've got to go out and build shit. I don't care if it's a web page, an article, uh, an app. It doesn't really matter what you're building. You've got to build stuff. Um, and then the final thing is promotion. You've got to go out and get people to see it. And so my thing was, like, if you're going to have silos or areas of responsibility, it makes more sense to me to set it up based on that flow because you can't, at the larger level, you can't do everything. You can't have somebody who's really good at managing production spending their time trying to do the other components because you just don't get enough focus. So you have to be more focused. So that's basically uh, the flow of how we set things up. So we don't have a search team, a PPC team, we have a strategy team. There's people in there that um, have expertise in all those areas, and they're in charge collectively of putting together the plan. Um, we also killed the individual budgeting. We had actually, and, this, and all the stuff I'm saying also applies to the client and the in-house thing. That's the really funny thing about all this, is that the stuff that we struggle with is exactly what the in-house companies that want to hire us struggle with. Um, and we run into this one on both sides of the fence all the time. Client comes in, they're a search client, that's great. They got a budget, doing stuff. But what a client needs changes over that life cycle. Very a lot of consulting and brain power stuff in the beginning. Then you move in that production phase. So in reality, budget should be able to ebb and flow through that process. And it can't really happen if your own company is fighting internally over whose budget that is. Or if you're the in-house, if your company is fighting over who doesn't want to take the hit on their P&L, to do this really cool stuff. We'd had really big name clients, I'm not gonna say who, because I was told not to do that, um, who basically said, hey, that's a great plan, but we can't do this part, because that's social media, right? So we're trying to build them this integrated attack all things, but they can't hire us because that's a different budget. So we killed that. Your client, one budget, I don't care where you spend it in our company, if you spend it with us, I'm a happy guy. Um, greater level of top-down transparency. What happens a lot in the process, when you're a little shop, you have your hands as the rainmaker or whoever, you're in every part of the process. When you get a little bigger, you have to hand stuff off. So you get in a situation and it's really like that game where you, know, you whisper somebody into somebody's ear and then they turn around and say it, and as it trans, stuff gets lost. It all gets dropped. So we really started working harder from the time of BizDev, a new client is bringing the whole team in from the very beginning, not just like, hey, you need to go do this, but so they learn everything about the, what, what the guy hates, what he likes, um, you know, what they want to do with the brand, all that stuff. So they're thinking about that as they're doing their part of it later down the road. So that gave us uh, an, an open ideation, meaning that we really do have group company things where anybody can come in and after they've heard this data, they can contribute ideas. They can contribute and participate. That doesn't mean they own that process. We have people that are dedicated to owning the process. But if the janitor has a great idea, I want to hear it. Um, that's helped us do a lot of stuff. Better agility to address all marketing goals for a client. Um, higher level of agility overall. And uh, most importantly, better ideas. Uh, so that was a huge problem. And happier employees because they're learning more. And now they can aspire to move and grow and do different stuff. Issue number two. God, I have a lot of issues. Product ambiguity. Uh, Rhea did a, a Whiteboard Friday a while back on this topic, but uh, this one is really important. When we came in, we were doing a lot of vendor work. We were building links for people. More traditional style stuff we don't do anymore. Don't do it, but we had a lot of people lined up in business. And in that scenario, but at, on the front end, we're a consultancy and a strategy company, in, in my view. So we're doing both. And really what happens is like, you got to pick one or the other, I think. Because at the end of the day, like it or not, the people that are hiring you as a vendor to go build those links or whatever, um, they're going to hold you accountable for the outcome regardless, right? So we'd send them position reports. Like we're implying subliminally that we are your SEO. We're supporting the idea that SEO and link building are synonymous. They are not. 
If you want to hold me accountable, I need to have control of the whole thing. And I, I'm more than willing to do that. So we killed that. I took, as soon as I took over, I started cutting stuff and cutting revenue, good revenue. And my partners were freaking out. And I'm like, trust me, we've got to get rid of this stuff. Um, so what we did in that regard is we fired that. We don't do third-party vendor services anymore um, for the most part. <coughs> and uh, this is the key one. We don't sell articles and infographics. We sell content marketing strategy. You don't sell an audit. You sell strategy. You sell a plan. Going in and telling a client what's broken is easy. Going in and telling a client and building them a roadmap is the most difficult thing. There's far more value in strategy than there is in a dollar price for an article or an infographic. Um, we're not a vendor, we're a strategic transparent partner. We had a lot of larger agencies that were the, the company behind the curtain who were basically abusive. And there's no value in that to us, helping them look good and dealing with their crap, basically. So I fired a lot of those too. Um, we needed to be a, a partner. So we, got, we relieved our production unit immensely because now they're only building content for people that hire us for our brain power. Uh, and we made content production profitable. And this is one of the hardest things in the world to do, I have found <laughs> in all this. So issue number three. God, I got more and more issues. Um, bad pricing models. We come in, and everybody had a different way to do it, and we're kind of all over the map. And when I really started dissecting, it's like, ah, the margins on writing a piece of content are different than consulting, and, and you can't lump them all together. We need to break them out and do that kind of stuff. So some of the stuff we did there is we grouped all services based on that lifestyle thing. I don't care what we do. It falls in one of those categories. Consulting, training, that's all, that's all strategy, right? So we can tag it and bill it and track it uh, separately. Um, that allows us to really track the cost through each group and really define and, and finding is like, wow, yeah, they're paying us a lot of money. We're losing our ass on this. Like, we don't make money. We're, it, we're bleeding. So, um, and made value-based adjustments to bundle prices. So this, this happens a lot. So, company does an infographic and then they'll bundle likes. We'll go out and promote it for you, social promotion. So, let's say you charge $1,500 for the infographic and $1,000 for the promotion. $2,500 total. You go out, the promotion doesn't come out that great, and you're like, whoa. And then the client looks at it and goes, 40% of what I paid went for this promotion. The promotion sucks. You're not happy. If you raise the price of the infographic to $2,000 and drop the promotion down to 500 bucks, they love you because you've changed the perception of where the value is, and the value is in the quality of the content that you produce because that's your stronger point than the promotion part. Uh, performance-based models and guarantees. I, I, I use performance-based stuff as a boutique. Forever, I lost my ass on a lot of deals. I, I did stuff, and I just kept working at it. Um, the idea is, if I'm going to go out and promote your content, I want to be paid by how successful I am. So we built metrics that we could actually pitch to clients that they understand. And if we get to the end, I don't hit those metrics, I'll continue and do more for you for free until I hit them. Now, all of a sudden, it's a much easier sell to the guys that were out going out buying links at 150 bucks a piece. Um, a lot of re redundancy going through that process. Identified, yeah, I'm going to place through these because I'm getting low on time. Um, improved client perception, increased margins, all that kind of stuff. But here's the most important one, is it creates uh, an environment where experimentation and failure is OK. I'm a failure learner. Um, that's how I do things. That's why I took this gig. I just jump in, blaze, fail, learn what I failed at, reiterate, just keep going through that process. You have to have a situation and margins that allow you to be creative and do stuff for a client that fails. That's what that guarantee thing is. So if I know that I can go do the easy thing and get them the links or whatever, whatever our goal is, I also want to incorporate stuff in there. And I, and I make our teams do that, is to go out and come up with new ideas and let's test them. I don't care if they fail. You learn from that. So that's the best thing. And on, on a, from a, the a client side of the thing, you know, those performance models allow them to sell those ideas easily internally because you can say, hey, they're going to stick with this and get us what we want, but here we want to go try this. So it allows them to be a little more creative and give them a little less risk. Uh, issue number four, poor client selection. This is the best one. Yeah, a lot of people want to hire us. And you want to take all the work, and that didn't really work out because not everybody's a fit. This is a lot more work. It's far more of a partnership. It's not a commodity-driven thing where you just go out and order links or you order an audit. You, as the client, actually have to work and engage in this. 
And at the end of the day, you as a company need wins. I don't care if you love me and you write me a check every month. At the end of the day, I can't grow my company if I don't do great things for you. Uh, so high probability selling, you should go Google that. It's a little book that I read many years ago by a guy named Jock Worth, and it will change. It's a $9 download. Um, it will change your whole idea of what selling is about and how you should approach it. My approach is it's all about efficiently getting through the people that aren't a fit so you can find the ones that do and latching onto those. It's not about selling snow to an Eskimo. Uh, reject the traditional RFP model. Just say no. RFPs are the most abusive thing. They want you for free of charge to build them a complete strategy and, and they're asking the wrong questions. So we don't participate in that. I reply back and say, hey, here's how we work, um, but that's beyond the scope of, we just don't do that kind of stuff for free. And we always focus on trying to change that conversation with that client. And uh, here's the biggest one. Learn to say no to the abusive dangling carrot clients. You're, some of you are in this audience. You know who you are. You're the big brands that let people put logos on your site. And you show up and say, yeah, we want you to do this project. We want you to work under this contract that is so one-sided that it's, it should be evil and against the law. And uh, we want to, and if you do a good job, we're going to be a big thing someday. We're going to give you all this extra work. It's bullshit. It never happens. Those companies do that intentionally to get great work at a cheap price. And that's why there's two or three companies, their logo is on every one of our sites. Um, so we fired those guys, basically. Um, so I'm going to blaze through these a little quicker because I'm running out of time. But clients learn to like you a lot quicker. Average engagement link goes up. Um, being selective and learning to say no and not being the yes men is, is the big deal. I'm never going to get through all nine of these. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, bad contract structures. It's just we couldn't work with the way we did. So we put in SLAs where we'd guarantee you we would get stuff done at a certain time. But we also put in client obligations, responsibilities. Developing content requires a lot of input from the client. You need to approve clients, got to go through uh, lawyers and all that kind of stuff. So we'd say, if you do your half of it on time, we will guarantee that we'll do X amount. If we get to the end of the contract and we haven't hit our numbers because of you, then we don't owe you the money. Um, subscription models, we put them on, hey, well, you charge a flat rate, we'll build up to X amount of content for you every month. But if you drag and take your time, you pay us the same amount. So you're going to pay twice as much for the content you were slow on. One minute, really? Uh, outdated content. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blaze. And this will be online, I'm sure. Is, all right. Really thought there's no way I could. Uh, quality consistency. That's the hardest thing with vendors is you can't get the quality always the same when you try to ramp it up and scale it. Um, what we did is went out and acquired a little company called Voltaire Digital that were really good at it. They happened to be in Florida close to us. They were a great fit. We merged them a lot easier than we merged ourselves because we learned a lot. Uh, we hired a lot of in-house writers and we also uh, sought out new writers. We also applied that subscription model to vendors. And uh, totally out of time. Let me see here. I'm going to skip this one. Process documentation. You need to write it down. It's very hard to teach stuff that's in your head. I struggled with that. Uh, completely, and there we go. Um, so I'm going to finding the right people. I'm going to get to just the very last one. We need a really fast forward button on this. Um, and here's practicing what we preach. I'm going to finish with this because when you're a local shop and you're doing your own blogging and all that kind of stuff, and you're doing your own content marketing, it's great. When you do the mashup thing and, and you each are trying to run the channels, it becomes much more difficult. And we weren't that good at it. And I never got my blog post done when I was supposed to, and it made my partners mad. Uh, we now have an internal marketing team that's completely separate from our service team, and all they do is market us as a company. And we do it with methodologies that we preach. So we practice what we preach. And uh, we are, use ourselves as guinea pigs to R&D new stuff. And the benefits of all that is you know, we see massive increase in brand awareness audience, better quality leads, and first and foremost, uh, actual new business. And my final thoughts, I'll be really just quick on this, is chaos is good. It's a good thing. It helps flesh out the weak from the strong, and it helps you uh, come up with new things, and complacency is the kiss of death. If you get comfortable at what you're doing because it's making money, you're going to die. Never stop innovating and iterating, and that includes business models and how you deal with clients. And most importantly, everyone, stand up and say no. Fire that client that's not a fit. Say no to the RFP from the people that 
have created this wall that we can't climb because they are abusive, they're not that great of a client. Spend the time finding the ones that really match what you do, embrace them, love them, and keep them forever, and use this stuff to hopefully grow your business so we can put ladders against that wall, scale it up, and kick some ass. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Sure. Yeah. Let's, uh, Is that water for me? No, oh. don't drink it. <laughs> it's vodka. No, I'm kidding. Um, it could be. Uh, questions, you guys. Let's do. Let's do one, maybe two, quick questions, and uh, and then we'll go to our next. You mentioned uh, a certain way that you used to bill, and then you changed over to a different way. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that would come up. So. so here's the thing is, is SEO, marketing in general is about, number one, getting in front of other people's audiences that are big and leveraging that, and then number two, hopefully building your own audience out of that. In, in Google's algorithm world, that you did that by going out and placing links. And what the algorithm wants was different than what Google says they want, so a lot of this stuff we would go out and write posts and get them published on blogs that had, and they were, they were not spun and, and duplicated. It wasn't the kind of stuff that got hit necessarily, but on old crusty sites that had strong old school metrics, right? 1996, it's got page rank six, and we would write articles for the purpose of, and it's what everybody was doing, and that's just kind of how it worked. Um, we don't do that anymore. We are 100% link building. Link building is a byproduct of a well-executed marketing campaign, it's not a standalone offering. For us, it shouldn't be for you. What Ian was talking, what everybody's been talking about, thank you very much, is so critically important that that's what Google wants. So we stopped doing that and we had to beat clients like pe we had people were mad that we wouldn't take the money. We had to re-educate them and build these models so I can say, look, give me that budget, let me spend it this way and I'll show you that it's way better. I'll guarantee it. And that's the thing, we're in an education phase right now because it's kind of like when I started SEO, I had to spend two hours even explaining to somebody what a search engine was because nobody knew, and it was labor intensive. We're in that thing, but the upside is because of this Penguin stuff, all of a sudden a lot of companies that weren't listening to Rand and guys like Copyblogger you know, five years ago, they crashed into that wall at 200 miles an hour, and now they, they, they're, so there's a lot new business coming, and you, you've got to stop doing that kind of stuff, um, and we just don't, and that's, we've, we've great content, we find audience, uh, places to place it to have great audience, and we try to leverage that. And the byproduct of that is link growth, and it's a better kind of links, and hopefully will last longer than the other stuff. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that um, you guys do some performance-based uh, kind of deals. What kind of metrics do you um, set up with your clients for those kinds of deals? Um, it can vary from client to client. It's, it's part of that conversation of what metrics are important to you kind of thing, but a lot of it is, is link-based. So here's the idea, here's the thing I found out. It's like, ah, we're not, I'm not competing against other content marketing companies. I'm competing against that old school link seller. So if I have the tools and the metrics and the data and I know and I can accurately predict, hey, if we get this piece on this audience, I know what kind of links that site for like, Rand site's a great example. I can go, I, I can push a button and pull data that says every time Rand hits the publish button, he gets X amount of links on average generated to the site. I can see that data so I can pretty accurately predict and if we can find the audience and build, so we go do that, so now we can bill for links that what come out of that against a budget that's similar to how we used to do it, like you charge us X amount of link, right? So I'm like, all right, let me, I'll, I'll build this model to do it exactly like how we used to do it, except I'm not gonna do it the cheesy way we're going to track and main, we're going to charge against that budget based on the success of the campaign. That means the scalability part about that, which is critically important, if I hit that in three content initiatives, great. If I get two that are super successful and I hit my numbers, I'm done early. Now they got to either pay me more money. It's not time. Like, you got to get away from it always being about length of time. You can't scale like that. You have to be able to make more revenue without adding bodies, because that's how you become the bloated agency. You had a bunch of college, five college kids for every new client, right? And all of a sudden, you're very thin on knowledge and expertise at the top, and you're really bloated with green young people. You can't scale that way. You have to find ways to scale revenue disproportionately good to your actual uh, bodies in the shop. 
That was...